Clear prop. Star 73 is Cherokee, number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's nothing to do. One Charlie Bravo, makes it in runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I'm good. I have been looking forward to this show, and the reason we haven't done it sooner is the amount of research time I think I put into it. Uh, this is all about Part 61 flight training versus Part 141 flight training, something that I talk about on a regular basis. I've actually learned a lot in my research, so it might change some of my talk tracks. You as a DPE give check rides to students that have participated in both Part 61 and Part 141 training. And today we hope to cover all things that come up in our questions and dialogue about this stuff to help students, I guess, make the right decision based on some real content that we're going to share today. So when I first, I mean, man, when I first started flying, I don't even think anyone told me anything about Part 61 or 141. But a lot of times students come in here, they're probably a child of an airline pilot, and they have heard about Part 61 and Part 141 and have some questions. If you could rewind back before before you had all the knowledge you have now, what would your earlier thoughts be on just the 50,000 foot view of par 61 versus 41, 141? Well, first of all, when, when we think of the regulations, there are certain sections of the regulations that we become very familiar with as pilots. And um, in general, part 61 has to do with certification of pilots. Um, so if you want to know, gee, how many hours do I need to have to become a commercial pilot? Or, or how much uh, night cross-country time do I need to have to become a private pilot? In general, you'd look under Part 61. Um, that has to do with certification. However, Part 141 is the area of the regulations that governs approved flight schools. So... Um, when when you want to get a pilot certificate or or a rating, you're going to be fall under one uh, of of these sets of regulations, either Part 61 or Part 141. I would say probably the vast majority of flight schools out there in the real world are um, are Part 61. I don't have any idea of how many uh, Part 61 schools we have versus Part 141 schools, but I would say the majority is Part 61. Part 141 um, is um, FAA-approved flight schools, and and to become a Part 141 school, you need to have uh, special authorization from the FAA and be designated as such. Um, there's a lot, a lot more oversight, if you will, from the FAA under a Part 141 school. There's a lot more structure under a Part 141 school. Um, in fact, um, you know, they'll actually come in and inspect your facilities and they'll say, okay, you've got um, X number of briefing rooms, X number of classrooms. Okay, you're, you've got a simulator. They will um, look at all your airplanes and, and um, you know. They do I, more than just look. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and certainly they will look at your record-keeping system, whether it's electronic or, or paper record-keeping system. So, um, you know, the, the the first question is, which do I do, Part 141 or Part 61? They're both right. Neither one of them is wrong. One of them may be better um, suited for you than the other, but um, they're certainly both right. I All my training coming up um, back in the day was under Part 61. Um, in fact, um, well, there was there was one 141 school at the, the airport that I was flying at, but all mine was done on Part 61. I will say from an examiner standpoint, um, the check ride that the applicant is going to get is exactly the same. I'm not going to um, give a different check ride to a 141 student versus a Part 61 student. It's going to be exactly the same. Um, there is a little bit, um, you know, when I when I go in and, and get some pre-approvals and, and go through the IACRA process, I do have to enter the, the name of the flight school if it's a part for 141, um, and, and I have to have their, their designation um, authorization number. Um, versus Part 61, you don't have to do that. There's no place to put down the flight school in a Part 61 application. Um, 
in on a part 61 application i'm going to be looking at the logbook and uh, extensively and going through all the flight times and so forth uh, where part 141 really what i'm looking for is a graduation certificate that says that the applicant graduated from the approved course that they're they're taking the check ride for yeah so as the check ride comes after all that training, so let's rewind a little bit and say, well, what do we what do we do? A fly school that's a part one forty one fly school do? We pretty much it, it kind of gets down to like you said, oversight and then a lot of reporting. So they know every aircraft I have, they know every aircraft how it's equipped, they know every chief instructor I have, every assistant chief I have. There's certain qualifications for those. Um, I would say those are very similar, if not exactly the same for part 61 versus 141, but there's a reporting and a, and a keeping informed of to the FAA as it relates to some of that stuff. I would say it takes effort. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that it's harder to be a 141 school because you have to do all the work to get qualified, which could take years. And thank goodness the previous owner did all that hard work to get approved originally. Uh, and now we go through a renewal process every two years and uh, keep track. And we do go through, I'm going to say, a half dozen inspections a year. Um, they come out, they look at aircraft, they they provide um, a, they provide help, as we'll call it, uh, help us with our aircraft. And uh, the team in Houston, the one that I work with, a great group of people that I've interacted with quite a bit. Uh, but... But we are in tandem working together to provide uh, a set of uh, syllabi for whatever we want to offer. And we've chosen to offer private instrument commercial. And we'll add the multi in 2021 and um, some other things that we're planning on doing. But one of the things that I don't think people realize is 141 is, it can be anything. It's not just a rating. So you, you can create special curriculum. And if the FAA approves it, then you can deliver that training and you could graduate students from that training, but it might not necessarily be uh, something that we normally think about. So uh, we, for years, have had a flight review that's one. It's a 141 course that you can take that's approved by the FAA, and you can graduate from our 141 flight review. Um, but it still follows the AC that we all use to do it. It's just we've created a level of structure and rigor around that flight review uh, both to prepare a student as they come into the flight school and then as they graduate that program, which is just a flight review, um, that, that feels more like it's a 141 course. Uh, every flight school, anybody who's training, trains under Part 61 or has the option to train under Part 61. And um, I think there's some themes that go around with some of this. When I asked you what do you think of, I thought you may say structured versus unstructured. I think that's almost – verbatim what most people walk in the flight school and say they, they you know I, I met billy who's a pilot and he said that i like structure so i'm going to want to be a part 141 student um and that does mean something in the grand scheme of things and then other people will say i, I i'm i'm part time so i really just want to do part 61 and, and while that's kind of true that's not the only two things that delineate between part 61 and part 141 the other super common theme is I hear I have to fly less if I do part 141 than if I do part 61. Um, and so we'll talk about each of those kinds of pros and cons and things as we talk through it. But um, let's go back to part 61, the certification stuff. Private pilot instrument commercial, we'll stick to those for this, this episode. Um, under a private pilot, part 61 says I need 40 hours of flight time. And we won't get into all those details because those details could change as this podcast will be on the internet forever. But those 40 hours, uh, I do some dual, some solo, some cross country, some night, some hood time, and then I graduate. Right. We, we jokingly asked before we started recording, Wally, how many people have you done check rides, examinations for that had 40 hours? Very few. Very few. Um, maybe I, of 500 check rides, probably 350 of them are privates. Um, maybe, maybe two, two. Yeah. So, so that's like less than 0.25 percent. Right. Of all those check rides. Right. Which is astonishing. But I, and I and I hear a lot of people have the goal of I want to be done at minimums. I'm going to be done at minimums. 
And quite frankly, if you're not a pilot today, that's hard. It, flying a plane is difficult. You're in a stressful situation. Normally, in a stressful circumstance, when you're training, you're doing something that's a little abnormal. Steep turns don't come naturally to someone who doesn't really love to fly and hasn't done a bunch of them. So add that stress to how often can you get to the flight school to train? How long can I keep that going? You're probably not going to get done at 40 hours. Right. The, the national average, I think, from the FAA published a couple of years ago in one of their documents is somewhere between 65 and 70. Um, at our flight school, I, I think we're somewhere closer to 52 to 60. Um, but it really isn't the school necessarily or the instruction as much as it is on the pilot. The, the student pilot has to be the one that really owns their efforts and what they're going to put towards it. As I say that, does a 141 student graduate in 35 hours, which is the regulation minimums in that world? And I don't know if you've done a 141 at 35.1 hours, but how many 35-hour private check rides have you done out of those two? I, I'm trying to think, and and I, I I just can't answer that. I don't know. I've done I've done quite a few 141 privates, but uh, they're they're usually above 40. Yeah, and so it's going to be the number that you need to be able to, uh, I guess, accomplish the check ride, perform the maneuvers, and be a safe pilot. And that's going to be different for everyone. So let's say there's a national average there too. I think the key is um, around those hours is they really get more advantageous around instrument and commercial um, right. from a from a variance between Part 61 and Part 141. So what are the big differences between Part 141 and Part 61 as it relates to instrument? Well, instrument flight time, and we're not talking a lot about ground today, but, but there are some variances in the ground components. But let's talk flight time. Instrument flight time for Part 141, you need 35 hours of flight time. Part 61, I need 40 hours of flight time. And the big, big number is in Part 61, I have to have 50 hours of cross-country time as, as pilot in command before I'm able to apply or take a practical exam, which would be meeting Wally. Right. So that's 40 flight and 50 cross-country. Some of that's going to overlap. Some of that I'd have for my private. But in the grand scheme of things, Part 141, I don't have to have any cross-country time. And so I don't have to fly any of that 50 hours. And that, that could be a blessing and a curse. We jokingly say, how, how well can you fly if you've really only flown one cross-country in, in your uh, aviation career? Um, so that's something to think about. But you can, in essence, take a instrument check ride at the regu regulation minimums at 70.1, I guess, Um and become an instrument rated pilot. Where I think the majority of Part 61, and you tell me you've seen a lot more of them, I think I was a 150 hour yeah. instrument check ride. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've probably flown, I was probably a 60 hour private. Right. Then I probably flew 40 more. Then I had to get cross country on top of that. And I was in no rush. I wasn't structurally doing it. So probably in that 150 range. Right. Um, which is probably more common. Yeah, yeah. So, Think about that. The the big savings where people talk about flight time is part 61, part 141 is truly in that instrument world. Because at that point, if I'm at 70, then the commercial numbers, again, these are minimums. You'll probably never do it at minimums. But the need for commercials, 190 hours. So I need 120 more hours. There's some regulations on how much flight time I do with an instructor, et cetera. And in part 61, it's 250 hours. So it's still a, it's hard to say where is that coming from, but almost the 60 hour difference is the five in private, five in instrument, and the 50 cross country that go away as it relates to the instrument. So right. you really could fly 60 hours less and become a commercial pilot under part 141. And that 60 hours, it's just give or take it, round it off, national averages. 200 to 250 an hour for dual instruction. Not all of it be dual. So we'll say 200 hour, $200 an hour. That's about 12 grand. That's a lot of money. Uh, yeah. And, and that's something that you need to take into effect. Right. For sure. Right. 
I, I, you know, I, going back to the difference in part 61 and, and 141, 61 or 141 is definitely more structured. Um, you know, I, I work with, with some flight schools where when, when the applicant or when the student walks in the door, they don't even know who their instructor is going to be that day. Um, there's, there's good and bad to that. I mean, if you have a instructor that you've built a rapport with and you're, you get along with and, and they're, they're teaching you, um, and then you, you go to a different instructor the next day, um, obviously, obviously that's maybe not a good thing, but it, you know, there is some good to, to seeing different ways to, to do the same, uh, you know, uh, different approaches to doing a maneuver possibly, um, one instructor may have a trick in their bag that, that the other instructor did not. So, um, you know, the 141, um, it is, it is more structured in, in that, um, you know, hopefully any school you go to is going to follow some, uh, some sort of a syllabus. Um, but, uh, 141 is, is more inclined to, to follow that to the T. Um, you do have some, some flexibility in moving things around. For instance, if we got a 1800 overcast day, um, you can't get out and do your stalls, um, but maybe you can stay in the pattern and do some things. I know there's, there is some flexibility with that within the, the syllabus in a, a part 141 school. And we have it where sometimes a complete lesson isn't finished in that lesson. They got to go back out and do some of those things. And, um, to, to wrap up the actual content in that lesson. But that's a good point. The syllabus is key, and, and I I don't want to top, get too far off topic, but you would want to think about using a flight school that does follow some sort of a syllabus in PAR 61. And oddly enough, we follow the very similar syllabus uh, for PAR 61 and keep those PAR 61 records electronically, much like we do paper today for 141 and will next year electronically for 141. Um, so the the, the 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 steps by which you take to get your license or uh, correct that certificate, then you 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 really follow the same things at this particular fly school. Um, and as you said, I might go to a corporate big big corporate conglomerate fly school that might not give me the flexibility to choose my student or might require me to go every day based on our arrangement. But I'm sure you can find a fly school out there that would let you pick your own instructor, would let you pick the days you're going to fly, and could still be part 141. You're just going to – you don't want to take too many steps forward and then take a big break to lose some of that momentum that you would have had uh, along the way. So let's talk a little bit about pros and cons to those things, right? We talked a little bit about the flexibility of PAR 61 and maybe not so much flexibility in 141, although albeit some, maybe not a whole, whole lot of it. Um, I, I, I'd say it's rare uh, that there is a part 141 school nowadays. I don't know the math either, but I'm going to guess less than 10%, maybe even less than 5% in the grand scheme of things because it's difficult. It's hard, and there's a sort of re- reporting and regulation and oversight that maybe not everyone uh, wants to put up with or deal with. Um, but that creates the, potentially a cost factor which doesn't happen at my flight school or our flight school. The cost is the same if you're 141 or part 61. We've just decided to do both. But I can see where there might be a, a level of overhead that's more expensive for the flight school to maintain those people yeah. uh, and to do that and might make that school a little bit more expensive. Um, some people talk about the rigidity of a 141 program and that that might not be they're more free-spirited and free-willed and want to go hop around. I can see that being a personal preference, not necessarily a pro or a con. Um, that could be probably seen both ways for sure. Um, any other things that you're thinking about from a Part 61, 141 pros and cons? The equipment's the same. Yeah. The books are the same. I mean, for all, all intents and purposes, we're still following the private eye, pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge and the airplane flying handbook and right. Uh, right. a certain syllabus that we may have chosen, but y- you learn – the wing still stalls when it reaches its critical angle of attack. Right, and, and the the pilot certificate that you get is the same. It doesn't it doesn't differentiate between sixty one or one forty one. No gold star uh, on there. No, right? no. I think if you go to a job interview, unless they flat out asked you, um, you know, unless they really dug into that logbook and saw that you got a commercial pilot certificate at two hundred and one hours, um, you know, they they probably wouldn't. Wouldn't even know. So, um, 
you know, I don't see a, a big difference from that standpoint. I, I gave a young man a check ride um, probably four or five months ago, um, and honestly, I he, he was an instrument student on a uh, Part One Forty One, and uh, the the day before the check ride, as I always do, I pulled up his application and went through it, and uh, his total flight time was about um, it's like eighty some odd hours. That's not and, much. and I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, boy, this is not going to go well. And it was um, a check ride out of town, so they really didn't know me. Um, uh, we went out and did the check ride, and the, the, the young man did a, uh, an excellent job, a really good job. So it can be done. Um, maybe not for everybody. I, I told him, I said, either you just really worked hard or, or you're – instruction is really good and it was probably both probably right. both before that um for all that to come together but like we said earlier it really comes down to the student too they right. have to do it they have to own it they have to study like any other student taking on some new task um and, and it's just going to be a rarity that someone meets the the low number of hours like that for sure for an instrument rating maybe not a pro versus con but some of the some of the things that quote unquote bite students that start one way and want to finish another way we'll talk through some of those i guess the big one is if you start working towards a certificate part 61 it's probably going to be more unlikely to be cost effective to go 141 after the fact because the way it's structured and the way that it's been approved by the faa you probably won't get to count a lot of those you won't get to count any of those previous hours that you put towards that certificate if they're for the training purposes of that certificate. So the dual instruction, you might go to a school and do 10 hours of dual instrument instruction with Billy, the CFI there, and then say, I want to go 141 at another flight school. Well, the 10 hours of dual you did with Billy, all instrument training probably won't fit into their syllabus. You won't get the credit for that time. You're not going to get to count those hours. It could be time building or PIC time. It might on the periphery count in some way, but it's not going to be towards the minimums of that particular course outline that's been approved by the FAA. The other thing is transferring if you are a 141 student. I can't I can't go 141 at flight school A and be ready to take my check ride, get mad and frustrated and move to the other another flight school and then them graduate me. Remember Wally said we need a graduation certificate and that means the chief of that uh, endorsing flight school needs to graduate you and that to be able to do that there's a certain number of rules around what that chief has to do see and be able to validate to be able to graduate you so you're not going to be able to bring all your flight time over finish at that flight school by flying three hours of dual to be check ride ready like you might be able to do if it was part 61 so you lose some of that flexibility now the one thing that gets talked about quite regularly is that if i've done all my part 141 stuff and that flight school closes what am i going to do well then most students just finish part 61 like you said there's no gold star there's no delineation between the two and in most cases oddly enough the instrument being one that's pretty far out of bounds you're probably going to have most of those requirements that are need to be met under part 61 instrument you might need to build some cross-country time um, or find a flight school that can finish you, and hopefully you can do more than half your training with that flight school, which is normally the rule to get you to graduate or get a chief to be able to give you a graduation certificate. Um, so there could be some things to think about there, but if you're working with an established flight school and you think you want to do 141, I can't think of a reason that you could go wrong doing 141 because you can always fall back to par 61. Uh, if you think you want to hop to hop from school to school to school, I don't think part 141 would ever make sense for you. Um, getting dual from multiple schools, that's just not going to work. Um, and then I, I would, I, I'm obviously biased, Wally. I own a flight school that's got a 141 certificate hanging on the wall, and we do part 61 training. I think there's a reason to pick a school that can do both. They've probably put in a little bit more effort, a little bit more time, um, and done the hard work to to have a level of, professionalism that maybe some don't but that's definitely not to knock anybody else that's just doing part 61 it's expensive and takes a lot of hard work 
Um, so there could be other reasons, but I think if I was looking, I might be a little biased on finding one that can do both and then making a decision on which I'm going to go with. What else do you think? We talked a little bit about a recruiter. Would a recruiter care? I don't know that a recruiter would know. We've, we've cleared that up a little bit. Um, and I've talked to a lot of recruiters. I've talked to a lot of regional airline flight recruiters that is, I asked the question, do you care? And no one cares. No one's ever cared. They really want the best pilots, and some of those best pilots might be Part 61 pilots, no question. Yeah. So I guess the last thing before we wrap up is which would you suggest for a student, right? I get asked this question all the time, and it's a very difficult conversation to have because there's so many variables and so many reasons to do one or the other. But let's role play for a second, Wally. If I was a brand-new student, walked in the door, and you own this flight school – what would you, what kind of guidance might you give me or talk me through to help me think through that decision? I would have to know what your ultimate goal was. If you're if all you wanted to do is get your private pilot certificate and um, and uh, you know maybe buy an airplane and fly around on weekends, um, I would probably say Part sixty one might be a good fit for you. Um, if you come in and say, I'm, I want to do this for a career, I want to be a professional pilot, corporate pilot, airline pilot, whatever, um, I, would, I would strongly say to, to consider Part 141. No question. I think I've had this conversation with dozens and dozens of new candidates, fly school candidates, people, parents to have sat in this office and asked this question. And I've really struggled with what's best. And I think I've come up with this research and my thoughts to say, I think if I'm going to be a, if I want to be a professional pilot, there's really no no reason not to do Part 141, and I save so much in the instrument time frame that it would almost be crazy to not really think and go 141 for instrument. Um, and then I, I I think that the commercials there as well. Why would I not finish it all Part 141? And quite frankly, the, because there's no downside. If I started to not like it for one reason or another in any of my ratings or something happened like a pandemic hit America and I didn't go back to that fly school for some reason, you always have the option to finish up part 61. So there's right. like, there's really no downside to that as, as I would say. Right. So I would highly suggest now with, if someone came in to consider part 61, if it's more casual and more, later in life and I don't have aspirations or dreams to fly professionally. But if someone came in here and said, hi, I'm Joe and I want to fly airplanes for a living, then I'm probably going to point them 141 all the way and give them a lot of reasons why it's going to be better for them. The, the, the bigger thing that we really haven't talked about that I'll, I'll wrap up my part with is that the 141 school also in some cases gives you the ability to have a restricted ATP at a thousand hours or twelve hundred hours, depending on some things, and deep in the regs, and and we happen to be able to do that here through our partnership with Liberty University, where you could have a restricted ATP, which means you'd be qualified to take that test at a thousand hours of flight time instead of fifteen hundred hours, and that's that's sixty six percent of flight time. That's that's a lot of time. Now a lot of times people aren't paying for those hours; they're flight instructing or getting paid to do something. So that last 500 hours might not seem like it's too expensive, but it's the time. Wally, what would right. you, how much would you like to have another year of seniority at your current uh, airline oh, job? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. So, so a year of, of seniority is a big, big deal, right? And yeah. 500 hours, uh, depending on where you are in the, in the United States or the world, it might take you more than a year to get 500 hours of flight time as a flight instructor. So, yeah. um, as, as I think about that, I, I would coach to the seniority and get in and get start building that seniority as early and as fast as you can because it's going to be super valuable when you get later in life, no question. So that would be another big advantage, but that doesn't mean every 141 school does qualify you for part, uh, sorry, a restricted ATP at 1,000 hours. It just so happens that United Fly Systems does. Anything to wrap with today, Wally? Hopefully we've cleared this up for some people. No, I hope so. I, the, you know, the one thing I, I stress to CFIs all the time is is don't don't teach someone how to pass a check ride. Don't teach them the minimums. Teach them how to be a safe pilot. Um, you know, and and let the let the minimums uh, you know fall where they may. Don't don't worry about the minimums. Don't go out there and say. Um, 
okay, we've got three hours of instrument time. We're good to go. If they need more instrument time, give them more instrument time. We've, we've got to, you know, we got to produce safe pilots, not just pilots who meet the minimums. Yeah, and I guess my soapbox there would be use the sim when you have the opportunity. Let that don't stop at three. Like it's a great tool. It's a great way to use uh, some flight time for the student that they can log later on. Part sixty one or one forty one, irrespective. Use the tools at your disposal to help them be great pilots. As always, stay behind the prop and fly safe. Thanks for listening. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe. Fly safe.